stop. Reflect into aporia. Light itself is invisible. You can't see light. You can only see by means of it. You see through it. Just like the eye is invisible, you see by means of it and through it. Are you starting to feel why people could see these as deeply belonging together? Welcome back to After Socrates. This is episode four, but it's kind of the second part of the argument that began in episode three. So last time we turned to two important questions. One important question was, how, how do we actually practice dialectic into dialogos? And we took that as our first question, but there's a related question about what is the logos? What do we mean by this term uh, within dialogos? We saw that the historical sources do not provide any direct instructions on how to practice dialectic. Uh, and, pro and they do this probably for three good and interrelated reasons, which we need to respect in our interpretation. I propose that what we need to do is reverse engineer dialectic. There's a good Latin term uh, used by Philip Carey in his book on Augustine's invention of the self. But Carey says, I don't like the word invention. I like the Latin word inventio because it means to make and discover. And that's what we're doing in reverse engineering. We're trying to make something, but in making it, we're trying to discover the principles behind a phenomena that we're trying to explain. And I took you through the example of how that works in AI. And then what we've been trying to do is reverse engineer dialectic, and that we can do this because we can know, we've got a very good sense of what it is supposed to produce, what its results are supposed to be. We have discussions about that in the sources, and then we have excellent scholarship about that. And we turn to that scholarship, and we took a look at several uh, think, uh, important think, recent thinkers, and we looked at that dialectic is supposed to produce non produce our awareness, our realization of non-propositional knowing, noesis and gnosis, and help us to appreciate, in both senses of the word of understand and to value, the centrality of non-propositional knowing for meaning-making, for wisdom, for the cultivation of virtue. We also took a look at how dialectic is supposed to result in uh, second-person perspective coming into prominence, within dialogue. And I wanna, I wanna stop there as part of this review and expand that a little bit. So I've been engaging in a lot of participant observation and participant experimentation and things like circling. Uh, I did that with Taylor Barrett uh, and a wonderful group of people. Peter Lindbergh was there um, within Toronto. I've talked a lot and, and, and uh, done practices with Guy Senstock, one of the uh, inventors of circling. And circling is one of these practices in which you get into this shared flow state within the collective intelligence of that distributed cognition. The cognition, no one person is, it's like, like I said, that conversation that takes on a life of its own, that living logos. No one person is responsible and what you're doing in circling, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later in the series. Um, what we're doing in circling is you're doing that kind of foregrounding of the second per person perspective because of the intense flowing dialogue that's happening. And what people talk about is they talk about the we space. There's this, there's this thing, and let's remember the caution about not thinking of everything as things, but there's something, there's a presence. And when you say that, it sounds like I'm doing early 20th century spiritualism or something like that. But there's this presence of a sense of a guiding intelligence 
that does not belong to any one person, but is being right generated by the collective intelligence of all the people bound together in this living system of dialogue. And what's really intriguing is, first of all, what does that feel like from the inside? Um, it feels almost like a psychedelic experience because, because you are keeping track of all of these different perspectives, but you're also being very mindful of yourself. You're engaging in mindfulness as you're doing these practices, as I've been teaching you some mindfulness. You, you are taking all these, these perspectives and integrating them into your self-awareness, and you're taking your self-awareness and integrating it into all these perspectives. And what that means is different parts of the self, and I actually think different parts of the brain, are talking to each other that are normally not talking to each other. And it, ha- it very much has that kind of pregnant presencing that you get in the flow state or even in uh, psychedelics. Now that's all happening, right? But that is just one pole, and everybody feels that heightened, I don't know what to call it, that heightened inner dialogue and the heightened outer dialogue are completely resonating with each other, and it's not centered in anybody. It's centered in something between them all. And all of these people, and as far as I can tell, many of them are non-religious or post-religious, secular in some sense, they all start talking about this we space using religious language. It's really interesting. They talk about spirit. And they talk about, right, a sort a sort of higher presence. When you think, and we do use, even in everyday language, we talk about team spirit, about something that's important above and beyond just adding together all of the individual effort of the players on the team. But but that, which you can have a vague sense in when you're playing in a team, sometimes, like, and I've done some sports, you're in, when you get into that collective flow state, you really feel something. Uh, But in these practices, these dialogical practices, it's even more intense. I'm trying to convey that with comparing it to like a psychedelic experience. So this, this transjectivity, this, this, Right? This we space, this second, this prioritizing of the second person perspective. This is, this is a very powerful thing. I've experienced it and I've seen multiple times multiple groups of people experiencing it reliably and how powerful it can be. So I wanted to stop there in the review and really give that, uh, uh, you know, more of a concrete experiential content. The third thing we discussed or disclosed perhaps is even better about dialectic is that it will expose us to radical aporia that leads to a fundamental reorientation to reality. And this is a, will be a perspectival and participatory and even primordial reorientation. And we talked about how a lot of our most fundamental ways of thinking subject-object divide, we're moving into transjectivity, prioritizing the first person and third person, we're prioritizing the second person perspective. We think about the world in thingy terms, but that ultimately is um, just a couple steps away from aporia. And when we really want to think about and enter into ratio religio with the reality of ourselves, other people, and of the world, we have to engage in that fundamental reorientation. Okay, so let's continue the reverse engineering. There's more, there's more. Like I said, there's a lot of scholars and they're, and they're doing all this convergent stuff that is so powerful. Okay, let's step back and try to explicate something that has been implicit in what we've been talking about so far. I want to slowly draw this out. So when we're talking about the we space and things like that, and the transjectivity, and especially the second person perspective, right? we can talk about like a horizontal level of dialectic. This horizontal dimension is, right? it's the dimension 
the aspect of dialectic that's between people, in this deep sense of between that I've just talked about. It's between people. It's, it's the dimension of communion, common union. It's the dimension of communion. We can call it a communicative dimension, but we have to put emphasis on communication not as the transfer of information, but as the realization of communion. So that's how, when I say, if I use the adjective communicative, I mean primarily, right, generating the connectedness of communion rather than the transfer of information. That's the horizontal dimension of dialectic. There's a vertical dimension that's become also apparent. We can call this the contemplative dimension. Communion, communicative, contemplation, contemplative dimension. What's going on here is dialectic is creating a, a transframing in how one is relating to reality. It's creating that fundamental reorientation. It's altering how one realizes and orients to reality. And so it's not between people. It's between levels of reality and levels of realization. So you've got the vertical contemplative, and that's why I've been teaching you, you these practices. Right? And we'll, I'll also be teaching you the horizontal practices. So you've got the vertical contemplative dimension and the horizontal communicative in the sense of communing dimension. And then, what, of course, we can ask what binds them together. I'm going to talk, I'm going to propose right now, and I'm going to very slowly unpack this proposal that what binds them together is logos, that logos somehow covers what's between us. It's how the, how the what's between us works, and it's also how the between the levels of realization work. How we belong together, and how the levels belong together. How we, common unity, how we become one, and how the levels are one. Logos, one of the meanings of logos is to gather things together so that they belong together but also so that they are made intelligible, so that they can come into speech, so that they can come into thought. So let's think about logos is that gathering together and that living intelligibility. These dimensions are vibrantly dynamic in nature. Now, Another way of thinking about these dimensions, and I really owe the work I do with Guy Senstock and with Christopher Master Pietro to this, and we bring this into the workshops that we do, is you can think of the, hor the horizontal dimension as covering, being covered by a Greek word, philia. And philia means a kind of love. It's not eros, it's not agape, the Christian love. Philia is friendship love, but also, and this is important, a term we've lost quite a bit of sense for, fellowship love. You can be in fellowship with people. They're not necessarily your friends, but they're not strangers or acquaintances. And for those of you who practice Christianity, you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about fellowship. And for those of you who belong to a Buddhist sangha, you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about fellowship. These people aren't all your friends, but they're not strangers. There's not acquaintances. You're in community, common unity. You're in communion with them. That's philia. That's philia. And what's interesting, again, if you go back to, and I've had experience of people entering into the we space, as I've said, and they're talking about spirit, but they also talk about, they, they discover, especially when they do it for the first time, a new sense of intimacy. And remember what intimate means, a sense of something, a sense of something that's about to be disclosed to you, right? doesn't mean grasp. Intimate means, oh, I'm getting it. So hear that when you hear intimacy. We tend to think of intimacy as consummation, intercourse. Mm, put that aside. So these people are saying, I realized a new kind of intimacy. It's not the intimacy I have with a lover or with a friend. It's this other kind of intimacy. And 
I didn't realize it, but now I do. I've been hungering for it all my life. It's like, oh, I, yeah. So that's philia. That's philia. What about the vertical dimension, the contemplative dimension? So that's Sophia. The Greeks have two words for wisdom. One is phronesis. Phronesis is your sense of how to appropriately fit a situation. That's important. But they had another word for a different kind of wisdom, Sophia. And Sophia is the ability to relate all of the levels of reality together in a comprehensive, intelligible whole. Sophia, wisdom in that sense. It's about getting into ratio religio with all the logos of ontos, being. That's where we get ontology from, the understanding of being. So this is right religio to reality. And the reality unfolds and realizes itself and makes itself intelligible to us. That's Sophia. And the two are bound together, the philia and the Sophia. If you put those two Greek words together, philia, Sophia, you get this fellowship love, this communing, this flow within the collective intelligence of distributed cognition, everything we've been talking about, the we space, blah, all that stuff, blah, 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 yeah. And then Sophia, all of that, vertical. Philia, Sophia, that's where we get our word philosophy from. And what Guy and Chris and I are proposing is that this is the way of recovering philosophy as a dialectical and ultimately dialogical, getting us into dialogos, practice of cultivating wisdom and virtue and fundamentally transforming and transframing ourself and our relationship to other people and our relationship to the world. I think this is very close to the revolution in our understanding of ancient philosophy that was brought on by the work of people like Pierre Hadot and many of the Plato scholars that I've been introducing you to. We see this is why people are really interested in Stoicism, and Stoicism is definitely in the line, we're going to talk about Stoicism. Stoicism is the philosophical religion of internalizing Socrates and trying to cultivate a logos with the, your logos to be in ratio religio to the logos of being itself. Why, is, why are things like Stoicism and Buddhism so powerful right now? Because of their philosophy in this sense, their philia sophia, the love of wisdom, as opposed to academic philosophy. I'm not gonna rag on academic philosophy. I have a PhD in academic philosophy. Right? I think it's important, it's powerful, but it's important for a certain set of things. I want to keep that over there. And for many of you, and rightly so, that sense of philosophy is irrelevant to you because you're not worried about what is, it, what is science, what is knowledge in that sense. You're not worried about you know, what are the, all the different positions about morality. And these are, again, Important that there are people working on this. But you can plausibly say, I don't need that to live a good life. And you can even more plausibly say, because I'm on the inside, I see this, those people aren't living better lives because of their academic philosophy in any sort of reliable, discernible, justifiable pattern. I already mentioned that the professors of ethics don't t seem to be in any way more ethical people. So let's take all of that for granted. Again, I'm not, I'm not d dissing it. I'm not saying it's a useless academic egghead thing. What I'm saying is 
you can make a legitimate claim that you don't need that. You can't make that claim for the kind of philosophy, the philia sophia that I'm talking about right now. That is not optional to you. That is not optional. And I keep making that argument again and again and again. Now notice when we get into this love of wisdom, and when we, we start thinking about these dimensions, the horizontal and the vertical, and it's wrapped up with a kind of self-knowledge, especially the non-propositional, non-autobiographical self-knowledge we've been talking about here. All of this would engender, it, it engenders an aspirational sense of self-knowing. So this is based on uh, the work of L.A. Paul, Transformative Experience, but even more so, the work of Agnes Callard, her book, Aspiration. Let's try and, what's, what are we talking about when, let's try and get just at least an intuitive one, aspiration. Aspiration is when you are engaging in a project of deliberate self-transcendence. You are endeavoring to somehow become a self other than you are living a life in a, other than the life you're living in a world other than the world you're living in. You're trying to bring about a complete agent arena transformation, and it's paradoxical because how can this self want to be a self that it does not yet exist, a self that does not yet exist? How, how can, from this, how from this perspective, in this sense of identity, can I want that? And, and, and it's like, but of course, we're inherently aspirational, and we know this. Children are in the project of aspiring to be adults. But as the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. So notice, we've got that sense of aspiration. Let's go in. The self that's coming out of this model is an inherently relational self. Right. This is a point both the relational and the aspirational aspects of the self that's discussed very well in this excellent book by Christopher Moore called Socrates and Self-Knowledge. I always think of it as Socrat Socratic Self-Knowledge, but it's Socrates and Self-Knowledge. Isn't that a great cover? <laughs> right? that's, De that's Delphi. That's the temple that had, I've been there, Man, does that put the zap on your head to be in Del Delphi? You can almost feel Apollo and Dionysus when you're there. But that, the temple at Delphi is where the inscription, Know Thyself, was carved. So that's why he's got that there. Okay. He argues more extensively for just such a view of Socratic self-knowledge. So what does it mean that the self is relational in nature. And this is the idea, well, first of all, that self-knowledge is integral to being a self. So organisms can be agents, but if they don't have any capacity for self-knowledge, if they can't pass the mirror test or things like that, then we don't think they actually have a self or sense of self. Okay, so self-knowledge and selfhood are interdefining. But then Moore goes in, and he argues that Socrates, of course, exemplifies this, that we actually know ourselves through other people. There's uh, a line in this symposium where Socrates and Alcibiades are talking, and I believe it's Socrates who says, the other person's eye are the mirror by which we see ourselves. And the, the Greeks actually meant, if you look very carefully in somebody's pupil, you can actually see the reflection. So when I say through, I mean beyond and by means of. Remember, through my lenses, beyond and by means of. And you go, what do you mean by that? Well, first of all, remember Vygotsky's notion of internalization. The child internalizes the perspective the adult has on the child's perspective, and that makes the ch child capable of taking a perspective on its perspective-taking. 
It gets metacognition, which is essential to self-knowledge and therefore to being a self. So we become and know ourselves through other people. And you know this. If you take a human being right, and bring it up amongst wild animals, not in interaction with human beings, it doesn't become a kind of self. Now, it's still worthy of moral treatment. I'm not denying that. But it's not a self. What else? What else is going on? It's not only that we internalize other people. We indwell other people. Now, this notion of indwelling comes from Polanyi. First of all, he gives sort of a concrete example. And talks about, and Marlo Ponti, completely independently, uses the same example when he's trying to talk about, like, the non-propositional kinds of knowing, embodied knowing. But plenty, you know, you're tapping the, a blind person is tapping the floor with the cane. Okay. Now, remember the language we, I used when I taught you centering? They're not aware of the cane. They're aware through the cane of the floor. Plenty talks about a subsidiary awareness of the cane and a focal awareness of the floor. Same, look, I'm touching the table. I'm not aware of my fingers. I'm aware through my fingers. Now, if I didn't have fingers or if they were anesthetized, I would notice that. I would get numbness and a lack of receptivity. But normally, I'm not focally aware of my fingers. I'm aware through them of the table. So the blind person indwells the cane in the same way you indwell your body. All right, think about it. You also know through other people. You see the world through their eyes, through their perspective. They relate to you things that they saw, and you see through them. And you go, no, I don't. Oh, yeah? How, much, how many of you actually participated in the experiments that gave us atomic theory? I bet it's none of you. You know about that through books written by other people and through experiments done by other people. This is part of what's meant by distributed cognition. There's vast systems of people generating knowledge, and you know through them about atomic theory, about black holes, about the deep past. Most of your knowing is through other people. In this sense, you indwell them. So you both internalize and know yourself, and you indwell other people insofar as you come into relationship with a lot of reality and thereby become an agentic being within an arena of intelligibility. So remember these, please. Internalization and indwelling. And dialectic into dialogos makes this so present to you. You realize that other people are coming into you and becoming part of your metacognition, but you're also looking through other people, seeing right, the world through them. So you're simultaneously, how am I knowing and how am I being known in this loop? And that is a kind of intimacy where you get intimations of yourself and intimations of reality. Now let's return back to the self as aspirational. Your present self is in such a dialogical relation to your future self. What do you mean? Let's talk about it concretely. An experiment. There's lots of experiments done by, like this by Hirschfeld and others. Uh, this one, I think, was done by uh, Prady. 
But there's a whole nest of this, uh, nest, networks, not nest, network of this. Again, take a look at my, uh, uh, my, my Cambridge lecture, and you'll get this in more detail if you want it. So you go in to a university where there's a bunch of academics. There's supposed to be our best thinkers, trained to think rationally, use evidence. And you go in and you give them a really clear presentation that if they want to save for retirement, they should start doing it right now. Right now. You make sure, do you understand? Yes, any fundamental disagreement, ask whatever questions. Everybody goes through, right, yes, you have, no, we're convinced, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You come back six months and you see, how many of you are saving for your retirement? None of them put up their hand. None of them. This is because of hyperbolic discounting and I won't get into the details. You can, as I said, you'll get, you'll get that if you take a look at episodes four of, and five, especially five of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Also in the Cambridge talk. That propositional argument that they com are completely convinced by doesn't change them, doesn't change their behavior. Now you do something different. You get them and remember the imaginal. Imagination for the sake of perception, for the sake of putting us into ratio religio with reality. You get them to imagine their future self. And they don't want to do this. You know why? Because their future self is ugly, old, and close to death. So you've got to get them to reciprocally open to internalize and indwell. You say, imagine that future self as a family member that you deeply love and care about. Just do that. Forget all the argumentation. Just do that. Reliably, what you find are two things. When people do this, they start saving. Secondly, the more vividly they can make the imagination and get that sense of ratio, religio to their future self, the more they will save. There's a deep interweaving between the imaginal, the aspirational, and the dialogical. And notice how crucial that is to actually being rational. Not in the logical, I string propositions together, here's the conclusion, but I am going to overcome self-deception, hyperbolic discounting, and actually proportionately and properly pay attention so that I can realize the appropriate goals about the reality of my situation as a being doomed to old age. Notice all the overcoming of self-deception. So notice what we're learning here. Not only we're we learning about the horizontal and, sorry, the vertical and the horizontal. I don't know why I keep flipping those. We're learning that this, right, this teaches us about the self. The self is inherently relational, indwelling and internalization, and it's inherently aspirational. And the dialogical, the rational, and the imaginal, and the aspirational are all interwoven and bound together. And dialectic has to be true to that. Has to be true to that. Now, what's really interesting, and she quotes Christopher Moore, is this astonishing book by Sarah, Sarah Abel Rappe. I believe that's how she pronounces it. Her book and her work on uh, Neoplatonic contemplation and non discursive thinking in Neoplatonism, that's another one of her books. Brilliant, brilliant. She's a gifted scholar. So notice the title, Socratic Ignorance, Learned Ignorance. Socratic Ignorance and Platonic Knowledge in the Dialogues of Plato. So she picks up on this, and like I said, she, she's read more and she's incorporating this in. She really focuses in on learned ignorance and especially the vertical dimension, the contemplative dimension.
She says something that, again, sounds like, you know, like the triviality of I know that I don't know. And then we went through, oh, but what does it really mean and learned ignorance? And she says something, well, the point of dialectic into dialogos and the kind of learned ignorance it creates is it makes you know yourself as a knower. And notice how much that's bound up with metacognition and having a sense of self. You know yourself as a knower. Now, again, you can, you can have a trivial interpretation of that. The, oh, well, you know, that, that's, just, that's no more than saying uh, I, I can uh, uh, affirm uh, the proposition that I know things and other animals can't do that. Well, that's not what she's talking about. She's talking about a perspectival and participatory transformation that takes you into this primordial level of the self. Well, yeah, step, be willing to play with Aporia. What is it that you have that the animals don't have that allows you to make that statement and really own it? What, what do you mean? What makes that possible? Go to the primordial. Step below the proposition to the perspectival and the participatory that's making the, pro the proposition viable to you. Oh. So she's saying, so the self is bound up with this process of realizing itself as it's realizing reality, as it's realizing itself, as it's realizing reality. But then she does something about moving you into aporia, getting you to realize the mystery of this. And here, this is so fantastic. What could be so, what could be more familiar to you than your own self? But is it, what is yourself? Now, let's be careful about how we're using this word. There's a, there's a use of the word, word self, which just means a process recurs. Like when we say a tornado self-organizes. In saying that a tornado self-organizes, we don't mean that it, it then has a self. I'm not using self in that sense. I'm using it when we say, I want to know myself better. I want to aspire to being a better person. And personhood and selfhood are deeply interrelated. Now, what is this mystery? She goes into this, and she, she makes use of um, a distinction that's talked about many people, James famously talked about. And if you want to see this in depth and being developed dialogically, take a look at a series I have on my channel called The Elusive Eye that I did with Greg Enriquez and Christopher Master Pietro about just this. What is the nature and function of the self? Again, you have to first defamiliarize what that term means in your sense of self in order to be able to possibly answer these profound but basic questions. Well, what is the nature and function of the self? I'm not going to try and do that completely here. I pointed you to where I've tried to do that, and I tried to exemplify dialectic into dialogos as I'm doing it, with and through and because of two other people that I'm in constant dialogue with. I want to go back to this, the aporia. Well, there's something about self-knowing that's central to being a self, okay? But what is the self that's known and the self that's knowing in self-knowing? Well, what do you mean? Well, when I want to know who am I, I step back and look at some aspect of myself, some way I was being an in an agent arena relationship. I step back and look at it, and I go, that's me. And I'm using James's distinction here. That's me. The me is whatever I can bring into my frame, into my framing. You go, oh, that's me. And you're, there probably isn't a single me. There's probably sort of a, a dynamical system of me's. You know, I'm a father, 
I'm a lover, I'm a friend, I'm a teacher, etc. These are all me's. But notice what happens when I'm doing that. You know what I'm not seeing? And I'm going to pun here. I'm not seeing my eye. I'm not seeing my eye, capital I. What is it that's looking at the me? James used this term, the I. This is the observed self, the me. This is the observing self, the I. Well, you, oh, I can, I can, I can, I can see the I. Well, I'll, I'll look at it. No, no, it's a me now. That's in the frame. But you're not looking at the source of the framing. Because you can't look at the framing. You're always looking by means of it and through the frame at the me that has been framed, has been made into a thing. You can never see the eye. In that sense, it's invisible to you. You're always seeing by means of it. This is a, uh, in one of the Upanishads. Brahman, God is not anything the eye sees, by, but that by which the eye sees. How could that and the ground of being be the same? Okay, we'll work towards that. Hold that. Now, very, very carefully, the I is no thing. Remember, not thinking of reality in thingy terms? Whenever you have a thing that you're calling the I, you're actually pointing at a me and never at the I. And no matter how you try to step back, you will never step back out of that and see the eye. The self is strung between a pole of framed intelligibility and unframed because it is the source of framing mystery, no thingness. You can't see it, you can only be it. You can only understand it as a source of perspectival knowing and you only know it by being it by participating in it. It's a fundamental no-thingness. It is strange beyond the strangest. Just a moment of reflection, a moment. Well, I know myself, yeah, but, and those aren't identical. They're certainly not logically identical. And one is a thing or a system of things, and the other is no thingness. And where is it centered? Because sometimes the eye is coming from your mind, your sort of intellect. Sometimes it's coming from your emotions. Sometimes, sometimes it's coming, you're centered in your body, in your loins. And what's that space? It's moving between those centers. It's imaginal. It's not physical in any straightforward sense. There's this imaginal movement of the no-thingness of the I that is central to you being a self. That's what she's pointing to. You go, oh, but what about that stuff you said a few minutes ago from the Upanishads? And by the way, that's not imposing something weird on her. You'll see what I mean in a second. The idea is the no thingness that is the primordial ground of your selfhood and this is what people are trying to point out when they, and they get into this, these weird antinomies, right? No self, but the, the true self. So I've, heard, I've watched a Zen master monk say, you know, he's a Buddhist, there is no self. But then when asked what is the fundamental responsibility of a human being, he says, it's to know yourself. And you go, right? And you realize that the no self and the true self as no thingness are actually 
non-logically identical with each other, the same way the I and the me are non-logically identical with each other. Okay, so the no-thingness that's the ground from which yourself and therefore all of your knowing, all of your agency emerges insofar as it's perspectival and insofar as the perspectival plugs into the participatory. That, that, and, that, and how it's a weird identity, not only non-logical identity between the I and the me, but between the I from here and the I from here and the I from here. It's, uh, that participates in the no-thingness, the non-thingness, the oneness that's the ground of all reality, from which all of the things, the objects, are realized, are emerge. Now, I didn't give you an argument for that. I was just trying to explain this claim that you find in many traditions about people experience. I've experienced it too. And again, that's not an argument but I've experienced that non-duality, that fundamental non-logical identity between the inner ground and the outer ground. The deep, as the psalmist says, the deep calling to the deep, the deep within the, the reality and the world, the deep within me, they resonate, they reciprocally open to each other. There's a kind of profound love, because love is that reciprocal opening, that makes us one, but not logically identical. And that love of reality and that love of the self, they're inseparably bound up with each other. And you say, really? She's talking about all that? And she's, she's, a, like she's a Western philosopher. And she does something really astonishing. She insightfully, I think very insightfully, compares Socrates and remember his capacity for entering into deep trance. She compares Socrates to the great, and by the way, they killed him too, just like they killed Socrates, the great Persian, and Persia is really important in world history. Henry Corbin, right? The, Persia is what, what binds the East and the West together and the Silk Road. She, compa she compares Socrates to Suryavarti. Surya I'm probably mispronouncing that. <laughs> my partner, she's Persian, she'd be probably upset with me. But she, she tolerates my mispronunciations. This very famous book called The Philosophy of Illumination. He, he's a great Sufi mystic. It's also a great philosopher. You'll start reading this book and you're expecting, oh, mysticism, there'll be all this poetry. There's all this logic. And then he moves into, he's a great philosopher, and then he moves into the mysticism, the philosophy of illumination. What's going on there? Well, illumination. Notice how we use that word both physically and mentally, right? Illumination, the space is lighted, and that makes it intelligible to me, and that means the, there's an agent-arena relationship for me. That's why the first thing God creates is light. Because without light, there isn't intelligibility, and without intelligibility, there isn't, there isn't being. There isn't, because being and being known, although not logically identical, are nevertheless interwoven with each other. So light can point to awareness, and we talk about, and we use all these mental light metaphors, imaginal light inside of your, it's, uh, you know, things are clear in my mind. What? There's no physical light inside your head at all. This is an imaginal light that is allowing you to make sense and perceive the contents of your mind. And you get these people, I'm analytic, things have to be clear. What do you mean by clear? What's the phenomenology of that? It's important. Where's that coming from? So light can point to that awareness, that awareness that's coupled to right, understanding. 
And it can also point to the intelligibility of things, that they can be understood. Light binds, light makes this understandable to me. We can bring those two senses together if we play, and I've been doing it all through this series, and you know that I all, many of you know I do it all through Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, and I got this from one of the top five books I've, uh, I've ever read in my life, which is Religion and Nothingness by Nishitani. He uses realization in both senses. Realize, like when he said, I realized that she loved me. Like this, this is to come into you know, intelligible awareness. But realize also means to make real, like when we talk about self-realization, to, to make real. He, and he uses, and he says, I want you to understand those two together. In fact, he does this really provocative thing. He says, I'm going to offer you a definition of religion. Religion is the self-realization of reality. And then he qualifies it even more. It's the real self-realization of reality. I would add, for its own sake, on just to be clear there. What he's saying is religion is when Realization as awareness and realization as the unfolding of reality so that it is intelligible are actually at one with each other. We realize their fundamental belonging together, this deeper ontological logos. So we can use light in that non sort of purely physical way. So Suravarti is talking about reality. He, he thinks of all of reality as sort of condensed versions of light. And he's playing between light insofar as it points to understanding and light insofar as it points to intelligibility. It's about how self realization and reality realization are ultimately. And here, you see, I'm stalling because I'm trying to come up with a word I, right, that, that, that gets deeper to try and explain it, but I don't have it. It's, it's about the belonging togetherness, the logos between intelligibility, the, realiza the realization of reality, how it unfolds itself into patterns of being and intelligibility, and our self-realization, and how those are all bound together. When we internalize, we're basically taking the world into our self-realization. And when we indwell, we are basically moving into how reality is realizing itself. And as I already said, there is a loop between this. We indwell to internalize, and we internalize to indwell. Notice how much this is relying on the second person perspective on perspectival participatory knowing on the transjective. But notice that that horizontal, insofar as I'm indwelling, I can internalize reality and then transcend. Be able to rise above my previous perspective into a more encompassing, more realistic perspective. And then that, of course, allows me to better indwell and see through, see more deeply into reality. The Greeks have a wonderful word for this seeing into. It's called, the, the word is theoria. It's where we get our word theory from. But we think of theory just now as a proposition. But theory originally meant the ability to see, to indwell these patterns and see through them into deeper reality. That's what we do when we theorize. But not all of our theorization is propositional. A lot of it is non-propositional. 
And that's, a, that's the original meaning of Theoria. Theoria, by the way, is translated in Latin. Theoria is Greek. It's translated in Latin into contemplatio. You hear the word temple in there. Temple is to look up into the sky originally, look into the depths, trying to find a sign of the divine. And of course, we get our word contemplation from it. And notice our culture, and I've published about this with Leo Ferraro, we've said, oh, meditation and contemplation are just synonyms for each other. No, they're not. Meditation is, is, comes from sort of a sense of reflecting on oneself, and contemplation means to look more deeply out into reality. The point I'm making is this loop, and I talk about this when I talk about the cave allegory, and I hope you're still practicing it imaginally, and I hope you get a deep sense of it if you watch episode five of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. This, is, this loop is the anagogic loop that Plato talks about, the ascent, because that spiral makes me self-transcend, self-realized, and that self-transcendence is built, up, built into realizing the levels of reality and how there is a self-transcendence, not in process or awareness, but between these levels. So the loop is actually also a spiral upwards. I'll come back to this one more time, though. God says, Logos, let there be light. He's not talking to anybody. He's talking to himself, sort of, but not really. There's a Logos, and of course, there's two books in the Bible that begin with in the beginning, Genesis, and then also John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and everything that God made is made through the Logos. Okay, so that... I'm not claiming that the Christian sense in John is exactly the same as Heraclitus and Logos, but I'm claiming there's a continuity of development there, and I'm appropriating all of that as I try to explain to you Dialogos. I think we need all of it. When God, Logos, the light, step and think for a moment. Yes, it makes everything else intelligible, and he's creating both physical light and mental light and the connection between them. Stop. Reflect into aporia. Light itself is invisible. You can't see light. You can only see by means of it. You see through it. Just like the eye is invisible, you see by means of it and through it. And you're starting to feel why people could see these as deeply belonging together. Okay, I now want to move into three books that are networked together to try and furthermore, what does dialectic into dialogos produce? These three books, I'll hold them up. In sequence, here's Kirkland's The Ontology of, Socra of Socratic Questioning in Plato's Early Dialogues. There's Ontology of Socratic Questioning in Plato's Early Dialogues. This book blew me away. Uh, I'm obviously recommend bo recommending books. I've read uh, lots of other books, and I'm not recommending them, uh, typically because they don't say anything that's relevant to the project that I'm engaging in here. They often teach me other important things, but not needed here. That book makes use of this book. So Gonzales is one of the premier figures in third wave Platonism, or Platonic studies, I should say. But the person who really opened me up to it was Drew Hyland, especially um, the question of beauty in Plato. And there's a book he wrote on the Carmenides, and I can't remember. It's a specific title, beautifully written. <laughs> but this book. Finitude in, and Transcendence in the Dialogues 
in the Platonic dialogues, finitude and transcendence. I'm going to talk about those two books. I won't talk too much about this third book, although I highly recommend it, because this third book brings those two books together and brings them into the questions, the kinds of questions we're asking here. This is Magrini's book, Reconceptualizing Plato's Socrates at the Limit of Education, The Horizon of Wonder. A Socratic curriculum grounded in finite human transcendence. Excellent book. Excellent. I strongly recommend it. I won't discuss it in detail, but it re no, no, it's also a thin book. It's really cool. And it really does a good explanation of those two books and then draws them together and draws them into the question we are asking here. Because, but how do we actually create you know, a way? How do we educate ourselves in a way? so that we can do dialectic into dialogos. All right, I'm going to start with Kirkland. Um, Kirkland argues that Socrates is not, in his questioning, Socrates is not after objective answers. That's not what he's after. There's a lot of scholarship that assumes that's what Socrates is after, and then he just sort of demolishes that and goes into the text very carefully and makes his argument, and it's, it's very convincing. But, and this is, he equally makes this case, neither is Socrates after subjective opinion. So, he doesn't want an objective answer. He doesn't want an objective response, subjective response. Well, that's it. Those are the two categories. Reality is divided into the subjective and the objective, and that's all there is. Notice we're on or we're in an aporia here. There's no way forward. If we reject both of those and that's all there is, we're stuck. We're stuck. Notice. Kirkland is actually aligned with Gonzales. Socrates isn't after an objective answer. He isn't, af he isn't after an answer from the third person perspective. He's not after an answer from the first person perspective, the subjective opinion, the objective definition. But when we put it that way, we get a little bit of weight. Is the subjective and the objective all there is? No, no, remember that there's the second person perspective, not I or it, but you and we. Kirkland argues, in fact, that when we try to pigeonhole Socrates into the subjective or the objective, we're actually imposing a Cartesian frame, a frame we got from Descartes in the scientific revolution on Socrates that is anachronistic, inappropriate, and does not fit the Platonic text or everything we've been talking about here. Because Descartes is not about the non-propositional. He's not about the second person perspective. And he's very much about method. Doesn't mean he's a villain, by the way. Kirkland instead argues for a Heideggerian phenomenological ontology. He says that Socratic questioning is directed towards what he calls a phenomenal ontology. I think that's technically right, especially when you understand phenomenology. But if you haven't done phenomenology, you haven't read Heidegger, phenomenal just may mean sort of really ex extraordinary, or if you've got a little bit more you know, education in it, and I'm not insulting anybody here, it can mean just how things appear to you, subject, and you'll just equate it to subjectivity. When, of course, phenomenology, and especially Heidegger, were very much trying to overcome that Cartesian dichotomy. So instead, let's look at 
a central concept that Kirkland and Highland Infinitude and Transcendence talk about and they talk about it in Heidegger. And there's, there's, a, there's a bit of an, a thing I can't get into here because both of them engage, especially Highland, in criticizing Heidegger's sort of fundamental misinterpretation of Plato. I really recommend that, uh, especially for people who follow the post-Heideggerian, post-modern uh, tradition of making Plato, and I think Persig does this to some degree too, even in the novels, the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, of blaming Plato for how we lost everything I'm talking about here, and I'm clearly making the case with all these other people that that's not what Plato's doing. It's amazing how Heidegger gives this great care to unpacking the historical context and the etymology and really trying to bring phenomenology into understanding the pre-Socratics. He does none of that with Plato. He just takes a standard view that Socrates is the mouthpiece of Plato, the dialogue is irrelevant, the contexts are irrelevant, and what, all we need to do is extract the propositional arguments and just look at that. It's really, and, and, and I think Highland does just an excellent job. Is like, what's going on there? Take a look at Rakowski's book, Heidegger's Platonism, and he talks about how Heidegger starts really, really enamored with Plato, and then there's this sudden turn, and it doesn't seem to follow from any sort of argumentation, but more about something of how Heidegger was seeing and understanding himself. I recommend that book. Anyways, all of that aside, What is this Heideggerian, even though it doesn't take Heidegger's view of Plato, what is this Heideggerian phenomenological ontology that Kirkland is proposing? And it's, oh, John, this is piling stuff on me again, okay? Well, this ontology, what's the, what's the logos of being of Socratic questioning? What makes it real and realizable? So we're going to go to that notion that Heidegger focused on, which is the Greek word aletheia. A-L-E-T-H-E-A. -E -E Sometimes people put an I-A or an E-I-A. We're trying to translate Greek pronunciation that doesn't map one-to-one -to, -one to English pronunciation. So what's going on there? So this word is often translated as truth. And then we think, oh, I know what truth is. Truth is how my propositions properly cohere so that my propositions represent reality correctly. They co what's in my head corresponds to the world. And of course, that is our central notion, this representational coherence, correspondence notion of truth. And it is, it is you know, and many people have been pointing this out even within you know, the Anglo-American tradition within pragmatism and, of course, within po postmodernism, within phenomenology and, and postmodernism, within the continental tradition, that that whole framework just actually doesn't work well. And Heidegger was actually key to that. He says, well, what does aletheia mean? Well, lethe, it means forgetfulness, concealment. Um, and aletheia, like atheist, right, the opposite, means unconcealment, Come, things coming to light. And I, I'm using that deliberately, coming to light. Right? And this sense of things coming to light. And like light, it attunes the knower and the known. It makes it possible for them to enter into relationship of correspondence between each other and for the propositions to be clear, to be lighted with respect to each other. So aletheia, Attunement is more primordial and makes possible the subjective and objective notions of truth. Aletheia is profoundly transjective. And it's grounding and primordial and affords subjectivity and objectivity and their relationship together in what we typically call truth, the truth we assign to our propositions and our representational level of mind. But there's another aspect to Aletheia. 
Because as things are coming to light, and drawing our attention, our framing, other parts of the reality are necessarily being concealed. They're they're fading into, listen to the words, back ground. Ground, but behind us. The mysterious no-thingness out of which the things emerge. So the word phenomenon, where we get phenomenology, is a Greek word. It means shining, light bouncing off them. Things are shining. They're, they're, they're intelligible to us. We are drawn to them. We are put into relationship between them. This is all this illumination through the light of intelligibility. But remember that the light itself is invisible. So by making it, it, it and this is, these are bound together, in making other things visible, it actually makes itself invisible and thereby makes invisible what it emerges from. That's Aletheia. That's Aletheia. So Socratic questioning flows between shining into intelligible appearance but withdrawing back into the background. The logos flows between intelligibility and mystery as it flows between people and between the levels of realization. Dialectic into dialogos must afford all of this. Kirkland follows Highland, who also discusses Aletheia at length, saying that the point of the practice of dialectic into the process of dialogos is a proper orientation, a ratio religio, finite transcendence. All three books talk about this, converge on this, explore this. Orientation, remember, is self-knowledge bound up in right relationship, ratio religio, to the realization of reality. What does this finite transcendence mean? Why is taking that as our fundamental orientation so important? Why is it so central to understanding dialectic into dialogos and understanding learned ignorance? We're going to talk about that in our next episode. And that will also allow me to talk more deeply about orientation and this amazing book by Werner Stegmaier, What is Orientation? A Philosophical Investigation. And it will allow me to propose to you what logos is, how we can best understand, how we can best orient to our ability to orient. But before we do that, before we move to the next episode, I want to move to the points that we need to ponder. And then we'll move to the practices. So dialectic into dialogos must take us into the non-propositional. It must foreground the second person perspective and the we space. It must expose us to radical reorienting aporia and non-thingy thinking. But of course, thinking in a, right, not primarily, uh, in a propositional sense that's grounded in the non-propositional. It must 
have vertical contemplation and horizontal communion bound together by logos. It will afford the internalization indwelling loop that will spiral in self-transcendence and through the levels of reality realization. It will allow, therefore, a sense of the no-thingness of the self and the ground of reality, the no-thingness of being. And just, just a moment, we'll come back to this, but just one moment on this. Being is not any particular being. It is the oneness beyond, between, beneath, and within every being, but it itself is not a being. It is no thingness. And the best way to realize the no thingness that is being, the ground of being, is to realize the no thingness within, because then they can participate in reciprocal realization. You can come into... Ratio, profound ratio religio. Dialectic to dialogos will foreground aletheia and transjectivity, and it will cultivate finite transcendence, which we will talk about more in the next episode as our fundamental orientation. Now we'll move to the practices. So we're going to try and bring into practice, or bring you at least into practice, that is relevant to what we've been talking about in this episode, and also build on the last practices, because just like the two episodes are part of a continuous uh, argument, the two sets of practices have a continuity. You may be noticing these lectures are so long and the practices are so short. Well, you should be doing the practices longer. I'm just demonstrating the core of what you need to do. But also, uh, in other episodes, the lectures will be significantly shorter and the practicum will be significantly longer. Things will move around. So let's take it that you've centered and rooted and you've done the Socratic humble wonder practice. You've been doing the ah, ah. And you've also developed that, that sense of the awareness of awareness, the pure awareness. So we would do the ah, ah four times, and then we would come into a practice. Our eyes are closed, but imaginally as we inhale, we're doing theoria. We're seeing as deeply as we could into the depths of reality as we inhale. And then as we exhale, we're coming into that place you developed in the awareness of awareness. The pure awareness of awareness. Inhale, theoria, imaginally out to the depths, to the horizon. Imaginally in to that point of the most inner contact with yourself the depth of the ground of your own awareness. Back and forth. Do that at least four times or some multiple of four. So this, the gestural and the breathing and the visual. And then we move in to the imaginal where we make use of that ability to come into the awareness of that awareness, that center. The most looking at the mind we can possibly do and then the most looking through the mind and through reality into the depths of reality that we can imaginally do. Imaginally in with the exhale, imaginally out with the inhale, back and forth, back and forth. And then we come to the third. You can see how each one is building on the other, developing and growing with the other had only implicit within it. The third one, as I inhale, I let my sense of identity extend out like the blind man through the cave, sorry, through the cane or the way we know through other people. I indwell the world. 
And then as I exhale, I internalize the world. But that allows me to better indwell the world. My identity going out into the world, indwelling it. But then I internalize it. I let the world form within me. And of course, it's always forming within me. Because if I go deep enough into me, I actually get to the way the world is coming into being. Inhaling, indwelling. Exhaling, internalizing the world. Indwelling, internalizing, indwelling, and internalizing. These three are layered and they're deepening each other. The ah, ah, the looking out, the looking in, and then the indwelling and the internalization. You can see I'm taking you through the perspectival, the participatory into the almost the primordial. After you've done those three, sit and see if you can realize simultaneously in and out that reciprocal opening now becomes almost one in and out at the same time. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to represent anything. You're actually instantiating, you're exemplifying, you participating in this internal and external realization in both senses of the word. Just be with that. Let it unfold in its non-propositional, non-logical, mysterious yet making intelligible oneness. As always, thank you so very much for your time and attention. So I want you to put these two together. You have meta-orientation, I think it's a stance. Meta-optimal grip, you see how they come together? That is your, what I call, your fundamental framing. It's your fundamental framing. It's the most fundamental way in which your relevance realization is coordinating itself.